Hello and welcome to Talk Wildlife and another one of my Skype interviews. Today I've got with me Tom Compier. Is that right, Compier? Yeah, that's correct. Grand. And, and we are going to talk about dragonflies and not any old dragonflies, um, dragonflies in Vietnam. Uh, and there's a lot of them. Um, Tom, I don't know whether you describe yourself as a specialist. Certainly having seen your blog and having seen your papers, I would. Thank you. Uh, so, and you've also done the uh, reviewer book, which we'll talk about on another occasion, because uh, I think that goes quite nicely with the likes of the moths that I did with Alan, yeah. uh, and the butterflies that I'm also going to do with Alan. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on in, in maybe sort of the middle of the month. Uh, but for now, let's talk Vietnam. So first of all, welcome and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Grand. Uh, I think if we start off just by you giving us a little bit of background to yourself first of all and how you got into doing what you're doing um, and then a little bit about sort of what you actually do in Vietnam so what you're actually doing sort of to, to record dragonflies then we'll go into how you actually go about describing a species how you go about separating species um, so I think if you tell us a little bit about you um, and also if you include in that what new species you've actually come across in Vietnam that are both new to the country and new to science and then we'll broaden on that as we go through the interview. Fine, sure. Um, well, I, I've been a bird watcher since I was uh, since I was a kid and uh, done that for yeah so for, for 40 years um, and during my, my career I've had a few uh, foreign postings and one of them was in, um, uh, in Japan. Uh, this was at the so between 2007-2010 uh, worked at the embassy, and uh, Japan is for 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 bird watching. It's fantastic, but uh, it, it has its endemics and specialties and so on. But it's also an island country, a little bit like the UK. Um, so that uh, if you are, if you are there all the time and you go into the mountains, the same mountains over and over again, you'll see a handful of species that the first time are very thrilling, but eventually they're always the same. So after a couple of years, uh, I, I started to feel a little bit disappointed with the, the, the variety that I saw. And uh, I had a friend there who, uh, who suggested that I'd look at dragonflies. And um, at, that, at that moment, that didn't seem at all that appealing. But I gave it a try anyway. And the, the, the interesting thing was, just like in, in, in Europe, uh, dragonflies in, in, in Japan, they have the habit of being active during the day when it's sunny, um, you know, warmer periods and so on. And um, like the, the, the very good field guides as well in, in Japan on, on dragonflies. So with your binoculars, you can identify almost anything. Uh, um, and they're, they're photogenic, so you, you can make great pictures of them and, and so on. So actually it was, it was yeah, uh, something that I, uh, I really liked and got into more and more. Um, Japan has about 2000, uh, 200 species, so compared to the variety you have in Europe, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, then my posting ended and I went back to Europe, um, but I still had this, this passion for dragonflies. And I started traveling around the world a bit uh, to see uh, dragonflies in other countries. Um, the thing is, though, that good field guides, as you have them for Japan, you may have for the US, uh, South Africa, um, well, that's about it. It's a little bit like bird watching 40 years ago when you, you, would, you would make notes if you were in the forest in South America and hope that you could identify those species afterwards. Um, so I, I got into, into uh, looking more, uh, more difficult countries um, when I had to make the decision, well, I've covered this, the, the countries where there are field guides available. What's next? And then, as a bird watcher, I had visited the Reguard, which you mentioned before. Yeah. And I knew they had wetlands. And they had a, a species list of about 40 dragonfly species on their website. So I just thought, well, I'll, I'll give that a try. Uh, and going there, um, I, I, I found quite a few species that were not on their list and that therefore I had to identify by going through blogs, 
literature uh, as much as possible, trying to figure out what the things were that I saw. And this, this was um, a hurdle you have to take, trying to identify stuff for which you don't have readily uh, photographic field guides available. And I, I, I found out that I was pretty good at it. I was pretty good at finding out what these things were. Um, and then um, I was posted again, this time to Vietnam, uh, mm -hmm. which is for its biodiversity, fantastic um, for birds, but also for anything else. Um, and uh, so because I had lost my fear of the unknown, <laughs> so to speak, um, I, I started um, to the best of my ability, just uh, looking through, well, trying to collect the stuff that I came across and trying to use microscope and uh, primary uh, research papers and so on to identify things. Mm -hmm. um, and this is how I, how I sort of rolled into it. Yeah, it's, um, it sounds like a very similar to, route to a lot of birders. Um, a lot of birders sort of go either through the, the butterfly route uh, or through the dragonfly route, but they always end up going through somewhere, or very, very many of them do. Uh, I certainly did. I mean, my, my first was actually butterflies and then dragonflies, um, but love dragonflies. And in fact, I think, I hope there's no butterflies in this listening, but I think it's, uh, dragonflies are better than butterflies. Um, and then the other thing that you mentioned was that fear of the unknown, that fear of, um, you know, having to start again almost and identify things, uh, which is sort of, it's hard enough in somewhere like the UK, and we haven't even got that many species. Um, so to go somewhere like Brazil and then, you know, to, to follow it up as you've done, that... That, that's a massive feat, you know, to, to actually go somewhere where there's no guidebooks and all the rest of it and go, I know, I'm going to get into dragonflies. You know, that's that's some feat that I, I highly commend you on your... That, that well, it, I, it wasn't as if there was nothing at all. Um, the, 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 the Japanese have been quite active uh, in Vietnam, but being Japanese, they have uh, very little holiday time. Mm -hmm. So they tend to go always in the same period and they cover some species that they find especially interesting. So they didn't cover all the dragonflies, but there was at least some research, especially in springtime, because for them around beginning of May, golden week, that's the time when they all have a little bit of holidays and they tend to travel. Yeah. So there was this. I have here a, a booklet by um, a Vietnamese guy, uh, Dong Man Kung. Uh, can you see? It's a, sm it's a, it's a small, simple booklet. But what he did was he covered um, all the dragonflies that had been recorded from Vietnam in the literature of the last century and a half or so, um, bringing it all together. So th there were 235 species names in, in this book. Some of them are wrong, um, but anyway, everything that was, uh, that was uh, known or we thought was known, um, was in here. That was a start. And there was a, a French guy in, uh, in living in Hanoi, a, a journalist, who had a blog on dragonflies as well, uh, Sebastian Delonge. And um, uh, I, I got in touch with both the, the, the Vietnamese person, uh, uh, Do, and, um, and with Sebastian. And they helped me in the beginning a little bit, for instance, by giving me the PhD thesis of uh, a Chinese scholar, who had done all the gomfits in China. Now, in Europe, we've got a few gomfits, but the south of China and the north of Vietnam, sort of the heartland of gomfit um, uh, variety and uh, diversity. So uh, you can you can see on a, on, a, on a spring trip to Vietnam, you can see 50, 60 species of gomfits. So having this book, having this thesis was a great step forward. Yeah, and uh, so with the papers of the um, uh, of the of the Japanese, with the blog of uh, Sebastian, with the, uh, the the Chinese theses and so on, I started going into the field. And at first, I would run into the stuff that Sebastian had also ran into. So, the first step was to acquaint myself with common species that already had a name. And once you start getting to know the commoner species, you start picking out stuff that actually, hey, that, that looks different. Huh? Um, and slowly but surely, you start realizing that 
actually half of the species that you encounter are new to the country. And many of them are, have not been described yet. Now, the good thing as a bird watcher is that um, as, if you've been a bird watcher for a long time, you've developed sort of a feel for jeers, uh, for small clues that tell you whether a bird is different from another species. That's actually, if we're, if we're honest, uh, scholars that only work on uh, laboratory specimens, so collect stuff that they, that they receive, mm -hmm. miss. So there, there's, um, there's an advantage as a bird watcher that uh, helps you realize that, hey, that's weird. This looks the same as the other one. However, this habitat is so different that I should have a closer look at this, for instance. Yeah, or the flight period is different from what you're used to. So after a few years, you, have, you, you start to get a pretty thorough knowledge of what is common, and that helps you pick out what is new. Yeah. So being able to spend four, four years in a row continuously in, in Vietnam um, gave me a huge advantage over previous scholars that had been there. Not that I'm a scholar. Yeah? So I, I was there as a diplomat. Um, and um, uh, the, the good thing about being a diplomat was that I had the ability to have my own transport. I had my own car, um, which meant that I could move freely around the country. Yeah. Uh, and also at my own pace. And if I wanted to sleep in the car somewhere in the mountains, I could do that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I could visit many places that it would have been difficult otherwise to visit uh, because you rely on a chauffeur or on organized transport or as the Japanese would, they would uh, be in groups. Now, if you're a group and you go into a national park, you draw attention and there will always be guards, there will be police, there will be local people who want to know what you're doing. Uh, uh, many good things about, uh, about Vietnam is a very safe place, but it's also very controlled. Yeah. So if you're a group, it's difficult to move about in habitats without people telling you that you're not supposed to. Yeah. When you're by yourself, it's actually pretty easy. So I, I could move about quite freely. And having um, a diplomatic license plates also gave me a sort of a, um, I could not be bothered by guards and so on uh, that just wanted to bother me to have a laugh, <laughs> so to speak. They would sort of, you know, so it's, yeah, but that yeah. was an advantage. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that with the book, you, I think you said 235 in the book that you showed, Species. Is it, yeah, that, that covered two. So, how many are we up to now? I mean, you know, what are we talking about in Vietnam? How many? Yeah, it's it's, it's difficult to say because um, uh, some of the species that we run into now, we find out they're synonyms um, or they have been misidentified. But as you can tell from my blog, I think there are about 150 different genera. On that yeah, blog. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did notice 150 <laughs> genera. That's more different genera than we have species in Europe. Yeah. Well, I think um, not everything has been described yet. Uh, I found about 50 new species to science, um, some of which I, um, I uh, published myself or I'm still publishing myself, some of which I've published with other scholars, some of which other scholars have published uh, on my behalf. Uh, but anyway, so about 50 new. Um, I think about 500 plus 550 species probably that I've seen over those four years. Um, there's a, a Vietnamese scholar, uh, Tuan, who is continuously also publishing new things. Um, uh, there are quite a few national parks that I have not been able to visit because they're not open for visitors, either because of military issues and so on. Um, that's at the end of the day, I assume 750 species should easily be possible. Now, knowing that there are at the moment about 6,000 uh, dragonflies described in the world, dragonfly species, that is an astounding variety for one country. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Right, okay, I think what I'll do is I'm gonna share screen um, because I'd like you, if you don't mind, just to talk us through how you go about differentiating species in order to 
either identify it as new to science or identify it new to the country. So I'll just, if you bear with me one second, because I've got a few slides here. Right, so I started off with these. So we, we've got two for you to have a look at there. And if you just talk us through, you know, how you'd go about identifying, because, you know, on the surface, and if this is something that's moving fast, you know, across the water, they, they may look superficially the same. So how did you go about splitting these two? Well, not, not, not only if they move uh, above the, uh, over the water, they, they, they just look the same. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Under any circumstance, these things are virtually identical. Yeah. Now, the thing is, um, the, the fun thing about Vietnam or that region, uh, and, and afterwards, sadly, I have to admit that Europe becomes a little bit boring uh, for dragonflies afterwards, is that there are so many more habitats that have specific species, even more so than in the uh, Atlantic rainforest of, um, of, of, of Brazil. Uh, this is where, this is the heartland of, of dragonfly uh, diversity. And these things uh, are not uh, over water. These things are deep in the forest, over seeps, moist soil, uh, crevices in, in trees, crevices in rocks, um, all sorts of habitats that have no dragonflies uh, in Europe, but as long as there's some sort of water available, it has some kind of dragonfly that specializes for that habitat in Vietnam, which is fascinating. So these things, they lurk in the dark, somewhere in the undergrowth, where there is just a slight trickle or seep of water going through the soil. And this, these two species uh, occur in a, uh, on a hill, uh, it's a mountain really, um, close to Hanoi, uh, called Bavi. Uh, one day the area must have been all forested, but now there is this, um, there's this one uh, mount mountain that sort of sits in the plain, and uh, that still has pretty good forest on it. Um, and uh, so for, for Hanoians, it's the the, 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 the national park, apart from Tam Dao, that's closest by. And it has a temple dedicated to Ho Chi Minh, so it, there's quite a few people going there. Right. But if you go up the slopes and you look for these, um, yeah, these moist places inside the forest, you will run into, amongst others, these uh, the Panos Tictas. Now, Hong Kongensis had not been properly identified, but um, uh, we knew that something similar to Hong Kongensis and probably Hong Kongensis occurred there. Uh, and indeed, I, I found it. And um, then I found it, uh, I think, in May. And then it disappeared again. But when I revisited the place in June, I found something identical. But when I looked at it under the microscope, I noticed, and, and you'll see it on the next slide, that the appendages were slightly different. Uh, so you, you can see that the bottom one towards the end is is quite the, the, the upper appendage has quite a different shape to the other uh, the, the one on uh, the one above it. And that's the kind of uh, clue that separates these species because they use these things as claspers uh, to connect with the female. And if the lock isn't right, uh, the key doesn't fit. Yeah. So these are the things that um, uh, help separate species that superficially look exactly the same. Now, there are a few tiny clues also in the coloration, but um, there is some uh, variability in some species, so you're not always sure. But if you see differences like this in the key system, so to speak, then that's a pretty decent clue that this is something else. Now, it also turns out to be slightly different uh, in size. So um, uh, we, we chose the name. I, I, I published it uh, together with uh, Rory Dow and Fan Kok Tuan. And I, I suggested the name M Chai, which means younger brother in Vietnamese. 
um, because it's both smaller and it appears slightly later in the season. And it looks otherwise very similar. So they must be siblings. And M try is the one in the bottom in the left hand picture. That's correct. Yeah. 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 See, I'm a, I'm a specialist. <laughs> <laughs> it had nothing to do with the caption on your website. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, it, you know, same as in, um, you know, in this country, you know, the appendages play a large part in, in differentiating, uh, in differentiation. There's also these, these marks on the, um, on the prophylax there. Is, is that something that's been highlighted as well as being different? Well, this one has got blue spots. Yeah. Uh, um, and it also has blue spots, actually, as you can see on the uh, near the wing base, which also helps differentiate. Yeah. Uh, once you know, you can, even with the binoculars, you can separate them. But yeah. the first step is that you have to realize it's not just variability. It is a different species. And that means, sadly, in, uh, for, uh, that, that some of these things you first need to collect and you need to look under the microscope. This is something that I started um, realizing, but part of the work that we did in Regua, um, and also one of the reasons why I published so many of these things on my blog, is that you want to, to, make, it, to make these species uh, accessible, to make identification of these species accessible to everybody. You must move away from scientific papers with black and white drawings of uh, appendages and uh, the uh, say the penis of, of a dragonfly, which is impossible to see in the field, but and connect that information to what they actually look like in the field, right? yeah. so that you get clues on the appearance of the species that help identify them. And that step is essential to be able to uh, get more people to look at these things and, uh, and enjoy the, uh, the variety. Yeah, yeah, we've got a couple more here um, that again, I mean, is, is there, because it looks like there's quite a significant size difference there, but obviously if you're in the field and you've got nothing to go by, um, you know, they could actually look so pretty much like the same species, but clearly not. Well, th th this is very interesting because these uh, Lariothemis species, um, the, the top one um, was known, but if you, for instance, look at, uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a famous Japanese scholar, uh, Asahina, um, who did a lot of work in this area. And he describes um, that, interestingly enough, this species, this Lariothemis bifitata, has uh, some, has yeah, like different types of females. Yeah. Uh, I, he didn't apparently draw the conclusion that that might indicate that actually he was not looking at one species. And as you can see, they're very similar, although if you look closely at the, um, uh, at the secondary genitalia, there are differences. Yeah. And also in coloration, there are differences. And once you, once you understand that, 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 that there's a certain combination of characters that only fits the smaller one, and there is a certain combination of characters that uh, consistently only fits the larger one. Then all of a sudden you realize, hey, hang on, these are two species. And therefore, the different types of females are not just variability, but the one type belongs to the bottom one and the other type belongs to the top one. And these are two species. That's why the, the, the paper that I published um, mentions the riddle of Lyriothemis bifitata uh, solved. Yeah. And uh, the, the bottom one, therefore, uh, Leorothemis camellia, is not um, is not something that was unknown. Huh? But yeah. after uh, I, I drew the conclusion that they were different species, for instance, um, Chinese scholars contacted me and enthusiastically told me that this this now they understood that their the the the, 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 the variety they had in China was so different from the original description. Because they had camellia ah, right. in the yeah. south of China. And uh, the, the thing is, um, there's a, a national park, close, again, not so far from Hanoi that I visited very regularly, where these uh, species occur together. And that helps 
Very often, if you if you see them in the same habitat, uh, side by side, you start noticing that um, there are differences between them that otherwise you might overlook. Yeah, sure, sure. So now that we've set the scene for sort of how you differentiate them, uh, you've sort of asked me to pick a few um, from your website, which I've done, and each one will sort of have a chat about them, so you can give us sort of the background story to them. I mean. That looks sort of marginally like our emperor dragonfly. With the, with it's an emperor, sure. Yeah. And um, this is not a rare species at all, uh, but it doesn't. It wasn't known from um, from Vietnam. Um, so, but I, I picked it because some of these things, like uh, the the vagans, uh, what's it called, the um, fipiga in, in Europe. Um, so, not the emperor, but the the, the one that. Uh, that visits us from the south, and I said epifiga. Anyway, um, this this thing here um, uses the same winds apparently that also the uh, Amur falcon, uh, when it moves back to its breeding grounds from through India, um, going all the way east. Right? There's strong strong winds um, that these uh, the, these these falcons use. And apparently some of these species of dragonfly do the same. So um, they've just been overlooked because they occur in, uh, not inside the forest where specialties would be normally, uh, but they occur in the lowlands. And this is actually uh, right outside Hanoi. And I saw them uh, also feeding in the swamp outside my, uh, my the window from my house. Right? So this is a species that had been overlooked uh, because the habitats had just been ignored and also because uh, they only occur for a short period of the year, making use of these, uh, these, these wind systems that bring them all the way to Vietnam. Amazing. So another one that you asked me to choose. What? Yeah, it's just because it's a lovely species. Um, <laughs> this one, uh, actually not so big. And that's <laughs> now that that See, because, because I was just about to say how big is it given that it's called Gigantica. Well, it's it's eight and a half centimeters. So for for a golden ring, uh, Anatogasters are close to our golden rings. Yeah. Um, they just have a slightly different wing structure, and therefore are, are put in a, a different genus. But they, they look similar to the the golden rings that we have in Europe. Um, but they haven't been all described at the same time. Now there is some variability in the in the size, and I was um, I was confused slightly because this one uh, has the structure of uh, Gigantica, um, but was relatively small. Now saying relatively small, a, a dragonfly of eight and a half nine centimeters is is massive by European standards, but there are a couple of others. Uh, Anatogasters. Uh, there's about six species in, um, in, in in Vietnam, five or six species. Um, they uh, the, the females will be even 11 centimeters. So they're they're massive things, really, uh, and, and and they're beautiful. Now the thing with the uh, Gigantica is um, I've I've come across it only once, and I visited this particular spot in continuously over several years. I was never never able to to find another one. Whereas some of the other species I, I was uh, able to find uh, again and again. But some of these things apparently are uh, very rare, even in the habitat where they seemingly do occur. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's interesting. So you, you need many years of sampling these habitats to be able to find everything. You will certainly if you if you visit these places uh, in the wrong week, uh, and only once, uh, so the wrong period of the year, only uh, a very limited number of times, there will be lots that you miss. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. And this one, th this is amazing. I mean, it's, number one, it's a fantastic photograph, but that is such a nice dragonfly. I and mean, look at them eyes. <laughs> that's, so well, that, that's, yeah, that's sure. Story, um, that thing. <laughs> there were two species of Asia gomphers known. From um, uh, from Vietnam, um, and I described in the paper. I have to see if I say it correctly, but I think I described three new species and recorded three new for the country that were known from 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 China. Um, so now there's eight, 
Uh, I was very happy to name this one after Oleg Kost uh, Kosturin, who is a Russian scholar uh, who's been very active uh, working in Cambodia. And I've been able to publish some papers with him. Um, uh, but because he's been very active in, in, in Cambodia, um, uh, some of the work that he's done there has helped also solve riddles uh, in, in Vietnam. Um, and this thing actually uh, occurs uh, quite high up uh, near uh, Sapa in, uh, in uh, uh, no, sorry, not, not Sapa, uh, Dala in, um, uh, not so far from Ho Chi Minh City, so quite s suddenly in, uh, in Vietnam. I know that everybody has, it, has the map in their mind, but you've got Hanoi in the north and Ho Chi Minh City in the south. Yeah. You know, that is where is eventually the, uh, the, the, the winning forces in the war um, make the, the Americans uh, take off with the helicopters from the, uh, the consulate there. So, uh, yeah, close to that area. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that, it's, it's a staggering picture that I really, really like that. Very nice. And then we come to this one. Yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this. Um, Kefal Eshna, uh, there's, a, there's a huge variety of Eshnids, uh, various uh, genera. Um, um, they all look very similar, even between different genera. They still look pretty much the same. And these things all depend on forest. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to be uh, quite rare generally speaking, probably originally already, because they have certain microhabitats in those forests that are not available everywhere. Um, they fly inside the forest at dusk, mostly. So if, you're, if you don't find one hanging up uh, in a bush during the day, uh, it's quite difficult to find them unless you go into the forest towards dusk to, to catch stuff. Uh, very few people do. Um, so the unknown, they tend to be rare, and the habitat they live in is under a huge pressure from deforestation, especially the areas that dragonflies would try to inhabit, so swampy places. You've got the buffaloes, the water buffaloes moving into the forest that destroy these places uh, just because they use them to bathe in and so on. So all these kinds of species are under a huge amount of pressure. However, we found two. Algore um, uh, and another one uh, that we found in uh, the family. No, not this one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so another Kefalashna. And uh, we named them, so this one was named after Algore, and the other one after, we called IPCC, after the IPCC, uh, uh, in recognition of um, uh, 10 years after the uh, Algore won the Nobel Prize. Uh, for his work on uh, on climate change together with IPCC. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I wanted to highlight both the rarity of the species in that way and also how important um, stemming uh, ongoing climate change is to help save these animals. So it's not just the deforestation, but also the changes in the habitat that, that happen because of, uh, of, of climate change. Uh, uh, are so worrying for many of these these species and the, the first that you have in these in, in a place like Vietnam. Yeah, uh, yeah, and uh, I think a lot of people are worried. Unfortunately, not not enough people, and not the right people. So I, I have to go on to this one. I, I, I'll pretend my finger slipped last time. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah but this, so this is a species that occurs also in the south of China. Um, and it's it's just it's just, it's gorgeous and it's special amongst the glaucomphids uh, because the glo it's a, it's a group of huge um, uh, species uh, that's so size wise eight eight centimeters nine centimeters uh, look a bit like golden rings um, uh, very strong flyers many of them but also uh, secretive inside the forest many of them. Not this one. This one inhabits uh, quite large river systems, um, which makes it, what, if it occurs there, uh, relatively easy to see. Mm -hmm. um, 
But the interesting thing about this one is that the male has colored wings, whereas all the other species, if they have colored wings, it's the females that have the colored wings. Right. So Pileo, both male and female have these fantastic um, uh, black and white patterns. And if you see it flying from a distance, it really looks like a butterfly. So the, the name Papilio is, uh, is, is very apt. Oh, I was going to ask you about that, but that, that's, thanks for answering that. that, that I, I, it's, it's quite funny because I sort of spent some time last night and then this morning going through your blog and through all, the, all your amazing pictures. Um, and you could, you could pick a hundred pictures and put them up here and people will go, wow, because you know, they, they're just such staggering insects. They're just amazing. I mean, they're great in this country, but you know, <laughs> that is just spectacular. I love that one. And that that was me doing a part of political broadcast on the behalf of the Papilo. <laughs> yeah, so some of these things have, the, the, this one is brilliant because it's large and has these beautiful wings, but some of the others have fantastic colors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So such combinations of bright colors. It's, it's yeah, it's fabulous. So it never ceases to amaze. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that uh, the, the, the Papilio is um, uh, it's, it's threatened for two reasons. Once be, one is because it depends on these larger rivers, uh, which means that it occurs across long, quite long stretches of, of, of such a river system. But if, it, if that particular river becomes polluted, then it's wiped out over a complete range. Wow. So the other ones, many of the other species have microhabitats inside the forest. And if one of these microhabitats is damaged, there tends to be on a different hill, something similar that, that they can still use. But if the river itself, yeah, so a larger river system becomes um, uh, polluted, for instance, a species like this is wiped out. And the other thing is that there is trade for uh, these kind of insects. Sadly. Yeah. Right, so people will... Um, uh, approach each other on, on the internet saying, can you get me a, um, um, a specimen? And that means that it's important to try to, uh, as much as possible, avoid uh, getting uh, the, the locations known where these things fly, because they're so obvious once, they, once they're there, that they're quite easy to catch. Uh, they fly the same road up and down, up and down all the time, so it's very easy if you have a net to, uh, to collect them. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. That's really sad. It's it's beautiful. I, I think we'll just sort of sit here for an hour and know what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So you've already sort of touched slightly on this one. So anything else you would like to add to this one? Ah, uh, um, well, this is interesting because uh, there's a there's a uh, there's a, a national park, uh, Katien, near uh, Ho Chi Minh City, uh, which has which is it's quite a decent um, nowadays quite well protected area that is well visited by um, by foreigners as well uh, because it's so close to Ho Chi Minh City um, and it has some lowland dragonfly species that have disappeared elsewhere in Vietnam maybe they never occurred there maybe they did but the forest has been cleared in many places but here in, the, in this place, we found a, uh, a new species of Gynacanta, which is only known now from this national park. And it may well be that um, because so much of the other uh, areas have been cleared, that this is the last remaining resort for it. And I described it together with a, a chap called uh, um, James Holden, who is a local guide there and has become a very avid uh, uh, dragonfly um, uh, experts. Um, so anybody, I uh, want just to, to mention here that I, I'm not in Vietnam, but if you want to go uh, to Vietnam and you have the opportunity, and you like dragonflies, and you have the opportunity to visit Katia National Park, go contact James and he will show you the things. Right. I will put a link to him underneath the YouTube interview. Sure. Um, so you mentioned that, you know, that this obviously the distribution of this is, is very small. Do, do you have any ideas of population size on this one? Well, this is interesting that you, um, there's a few muddy streams very close to the lodge where, where, where James is, um, where this thing is pretty common. And so if you're there, 
during its flight period, um, on any given evening, you might see scores. Uh, and you could find them hanging up in trees during the day and so on. So it's, it's not very rare where it is. However, it is possible that those few streams are actually the only streams it occurs in. And having, if, if you realize that, then even though you might see plenty on an evening, um, they may, there may be less than 500 or so in the world. Wow. But this is speculation, eh, of course. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, um, uh, I'm, I'm helping uh, Rory Dow at the moment with um, uh, some of the uh, IUCN um, evaluations of species. And this is exactly what we what we run into. So these species may be locally common. They may have been uh, widespread previously, but it is possible that these are the last pockets of, of where they are. And then they are highly vulnerable to any change in that particularly remaining habitat. Yeah, yeah. And when you when you hear people talk about um, species that are going extinct before we've even discovered them and you hear a story like that, you can understand so, you know, that, you know, that is the truth, you know, that because it had that particular stream not been um, in an area where there was human, you know, living then, you know, maybe they would have gone extinct before we discovered. So, no, absolutely. There's, a, there's, there's an area to the north of Hanoi, uh, Hulien, and it's a nature reserve, but it's it's virtually unprotected, although it has that status. Mm -hmm. Um, where uh, both myself, but also people like Hamalainen from, from Finland um, and, uh, and others have been active previously, that some of this, the things that have been described there in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. new to science, are probably already extinct now. And so it's, it, it, if you, the, the, there are virtually, it used to be a huge um, forested area, then there was one stream that was still covered by forest. And while I was there in the four years, continuously people kept chipping away some of the trees to turn them into charcoal. And um, at the end of the day, as when the forest cover is gone, the species inhabiting that stream will also be gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's terrible. Right, so this one here, I chose this one. Um, before you sent me a list, I chose this one for a, well, I'll, I'll let you describe it. <laughs> yeah. uh, I saw this and I saw that because I saw it as part of the blog and I, and I saw these here, um, which I've never seen on a dragonfly before. So if you want to talk us through what they are, basically. Well, they're horns. The thing is, this is, uh, so female, um, uh, many of the female uh, damselflies, for instance, uh, in, in some of the genera, for, for instance, in Silesia and so on, they very often have very distinctive features on the prothorax because that's where the male connects with his claspers. Yeah. So it, it, you could sort of say that the male has the key and the female has the lock. Um, and the more intricate her lock is, the, the less likely it is that uh, a species with somewhat similar claspers will be able to grab her yeah. behind the prothorax where they connect with the abdomen. Now, the interesting thing is, why would a male have these things? Yeah. And uh, there is not really a reason. So maybe the female dragonfly sort of goes wow when she sees this yeah maybe she doesn't <laughs> but anyway he's he, he's got he's got these things but they 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 seem not to be functional now yeah. some of these features develop together with the features that the female is developing uh, so um it may be that but i've i've, I've never uh been able to uh, to look at the prothorax of a female of my uh yeah. but Short answer is their horns, and I've not got a clue why it has them. All right. Well, you've answered the, my next question before I even asked it, because that's what I was going to say. Why do you think that? Um, I, I, I say I've not really come across that before. I came across it on your blog and thought I'll throw this one in because that, that's really interesting. So well, there's, there's another species in um, 
um, that uh, I described with uh, with Oleg Kosterin from um, uh, one of the, the on, it's, it's a it's a Vietnamese island off the coast of Cambodia, where there is a, a species Amphignemis that also has a horn on the prothorax, mm -hmm. um, which the most similar species to it doesn't have. Um, and we describe it as a new species, but there is not really a reason why that the horn of the male would differentiate it sexually in, in reproduction from the other species. Yeah, yeah. Strange. But then nature's fascinating. Absolutely. So we'll move back to one of yours now, because you asked me to put this one in. Yeah, I put, yes. Um, well, I, I was able to, uh, to publish just, just two weeks ago, I think, uh, a paper um, together with uh, Philip Steinhoff from, uh, from Germany and um, uh, Rory Dow, uh, a scholar from England, um, on Cilicia, in which we published uh, five new Cilicia species that I uh, discovered uh, while in, um, in Vietnam. I discovered many more, but anyway, in this paper we described uh, five. And Kuzua uh, is a reference to the, um, the soft-shell turtle that lived in Quang Kiem Lake in, in Hanoi, of which there were only a few specimens left. Right. Um, and uh, sadly, uh, it's gone extinct now. Uh, but one of the, it was it was a, well loved by the the people of Hanoi because this huge thing was living there right in the middle of the of the city and had been done so had been doing so for a hundred years. Um, uh, so I named it after uh, after the turtle, uh, sort of as a, a to remind us of the the vulnerability of the world around us and the need to protect these things, but. I wanted you also to, to show this because uh, there are about 65, 70 species of Cilicia in the world. They all live in the undergrowth. Um, there used to be about, I think, eight or so known from, from Vietnam, but in recent years, uh, not just through myself, but also through the work of, um, of Tuan and others, um, now we have about 30 species and we're still discovering new ones. These things seem to be not very mobile. Some of the species are widespread, even though they're not very mobile, but others are very limited in distribution. And it's just fascinating because they're so colorful yeah. um, that you have in Vietnam a variety that may in the end maybe be 40, 45 species of these things. And 45 species, mind you, that is about as many dragonfly species as if you have in the UK, just within one genus. Yeah. It's just fabulous. It is. It's amazing. And the final one, I think, I'll just check. Yeah, final one is this one, um, which is an amazing species. It's, you know, the length of that thorax, uh, sorry, the abdomen is, is it, it looks huge. It looks huge on the bigger and the other pictures as well. So what can you tell us about this one? Yeah, this is interesting. So this, this again, the, the protocytus, um, this one I, I, I discovered um, near Yambai. And uh, because the appendages, well, they're, they're tiny, as you can see, but uh, if you look under the microscope, they're highly distinctive because they have spikes on them, which all the other protostictors in, in Vietnam lack. Uh, and that's why we called it Spinoza, and um, uh, that is why it was quite easy to establish that it was a new species. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so easily to publish. Um, but the interesting thing about the, the, the most of the protostictors in Vietnam is that they don't have distinctive features <laughs> on the appendages and there's yeah. no difference. So there's slightly slight nuances in shape. Um, they're all uh, like like this one, uh, not large, not very mobile. Uh, they sit in the undergrowth. They 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 don't they don't see that um, uh, and uh, river systems or uh, larger water bodies or anything. No, they sit in the undergrowth in moist soil, uh, mossy rocks, that sort of thing, always in the dark. Um, and there are about 10 different species of them that all look the same. Now, is that boring? Uh, no. That is, to me, that is fascinating. It's also fascinating because 
in a, that, that kind of habitat in Europe, you would never go look for dragonflies. And, yeah. and they're there. They're all thin. Uh, they're all very fragile. And somehow in that, in that environment where everything eats everything of the, of the rainforest, um, they survive. And they have their larvae there that apparently live inside the moss uh, on just tiny trickles of, of water over rocks and so on. And I, 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 I cannot stop but marvel at the, the ingenuity of, of these insects and how they've developed. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to come back to you now because that, that's actually prompted a question I've got in my mind that I'd like to discuss with you. So I'll stop sharing screen. I'll check the video is still working. So it is. That's good. <laughs> that's <clears throat> always a good point when you come back from slides. Um, you touched on it a little bit there, but you mentioned that a lot of these uh, dragonflies and damselflies are found away from water. So do they still have sort of, and you did touch on it, but aquatic lava, are they sort of still like dragonflies in other parts of the world where they need to go lay the eggs in the water and have aquatic lava? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, but um, for us in, in Europe, that means lakes, rivers, brooks, yeah. that sort of thing. Whereas for them, it could be inside um, uh, a plant that collects water, uh, a hole in a tree, um, a crevice in a rock, uh, yeah. moist soil, even uh, where the larvae can find something to eat. So, some, some it, sometimes it's on the first glance, it would look as if there is hardly any water there. Yeah. But of course, the larvae does need water. Huh? Yeah. But it doesn't need open water. It just needs to be humid enough for it to not dry out. Right. Right. OK. And then another thing that you did touch on um, while you were talking was this worrying um, thing about collecting and collecting dragonflies and damselflies and stuff like that. Just how much pressure is that putting on populations? No, very limited. Uh, it, the, 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 the pressure on the populations of Papilio, uh, because it's, 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 it's so big and uh, easy to catch, uh, its range is limited and the numbers are low, is that uh, if you would stand there with a net and capture all the males over a, a springtime and sell them, then you you could actually, to some extent, wipe out the, the population. But yeah. species like that are very rare. Right? Yeah. Um, it's also, it's very difficult to find dragonflies inside the forest. So to be able to have an impact on the population, you would have to be able to, to really catch quite, quite, quite a bit. Yeah. Of course, they lay massive amounts of eggs normally. So, for the other species, uh, collection should not be uh, a problem. Mm -hmm. What is a problem is deforestation yeah. and the struggle uh, for, um, for water. Right? So uh, not just because um, the, uh, the buffalo uh, pollute any standing water in, in the forest, mm -hmm. but also because people want to live everywhere and they want to have clean water. So to make sure that the water is clean, they will move into the forest and find the origin of a flow, dam it off right there. And uh, so, and through a pipe, lead the water to their house, which means that if it's just a trickle or a seep, that the forest below that, so the whole hillside below that becomes devoid of water. Now it's bad for anything, but it's especially bad for aquatic insects. Uh, so that the pressure on um, uh, on dragonflies is enormous. The variety of, of species is fabulous, but at the same time, uh, there is a risk that we that we lose many of them, and not the ones that are in the lowlands, that in the rice fields, uh, as long as there was not too many pesticides used. Um, in the swamps and so on. Those are those tend to be common species occurring all, all across Southeast Asia. But the specialties that live on that one particular hillside, on that one particular mountain, mm. um, maybe in 
a, a limited number of streams uh, over a few square miles, if there is a drought, uh, and at the same time, some of those of the best streams have been dammed off, these species are just wiped out. And um, it's, 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 it's a serious issue. Right? So having said that, uh, all over Southeast Asia, uh, nature conservation is uh, a very difficult thing. Right? Not because there are not well-meaning people, um, there are, but because the, the, the pressure, the, um, the social, economic, social economic development and so on uh, is, um, is reaching the limits of what the system can bear. Yeah. yeah. And protecting those areas is often beyond the, uh, the capacity of local governments. Mm. Yeah. Although they quite often want to. Um, and it's interesting to see that, for instance, most of the rangers, that they understand that the forest is important, but they do not understand that the water inside the forest is important. Yeah. So there's, 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 there's not a lack of meaning well, there's just a lack of knowledge about yeah. what habitats these insects require and why, it has, why it's not um, helpful if the forest remains but the streams are uh, without cover, for instance. Yeah, and is anything being done to address that? Is there any educational you know, projects or anything like that out there that, that are trying to address that, that are trying to educate the rangers and general public, really? Yeah, slowly but surely. I think, so, with a, a more, um, uh, with increasing middle class, there is more attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's certainly a, a direction towards protection of, of, of mammals, of forests, and so on. Uh, irrespective of the, the, the areas where people just tend to be poorer. And therefore, the pressures, uh, the, the trying to survive sometimes means cutting down that tree, um, even though people in the cities might say that you shouldn't. <laughs> That's, um, awareness is growing, but awareness for these aquatic insects, for instance, is, is limited. Mm -hmm. Because um, there is not a very good uh, biology education, for instance. And they tend to stress different things. It's, it's interesting because uh, countries where, where uh, the British have been uh, around um, tend to have some sort of um, tradition of looking at uh, biodiversity and natural history. Uh, many other places don't. I'm not saying that everywhere where the Brits went, it's uh, topsy-turvy and everything they did was well, but this is, some, some, this, this is a good legacy. Huh? Uh, but in, in, in Vietnam, it's been, um, it's been, it's been lacking. So it's, it's very uh, encouraging that uh, young scholars like uh, Phan Quoc Tuan um, uh, are now publishing on their own dragonflies. Uh, and it's essential that, that, that we support mm -hmm. local scientists there who are not in a position like I was, that I have a, a salary that allows me to travel around the country easily, I have my own car, uh, but that you have people there that um, have limited funds, but the, willing, the willingness and interest to research those areas, publish those species, and through that, eventually raise the profile yeah, the importance of these species. Uh, uh, why the book in Lego was so important was that um, if people want to, if, if people can recognize these things by themselves, they'll take, it will be fun to do. Yeah. Not everybody wants to sit every evening behind a microscope. Yeah. <laughs> Just so that he can differentiate between things that look exactly the same yeah. uh, to, the, to the naked eye uh, and, and sit in, 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 in the shade somewhere deep in the forest. Uh, um, but yeah, so the first step is to help uh, each other, uh, help scholars in those countries to, to educate um, the people around them. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, I, th I think I mean, it was absolutely fascinating. We've gone on for nearly an hour and I know you've got to go and 
pick up a car or something in the next. I do. <laughs> so, <but thank you. laughs> yeah. um, I, it honestly has been absolutely fascinating, and I, and I really feel you know people should go onto your blog, go onto the website, and have a look through some of those species because some of the pictures are absolutely amazing. There's some brilliant species there. Um, for now, because I know that we're going to talk again about the Regua dragonfly book uh, that you're part of um maybe a, a little bit later in the month but for now thank you ever so much because that has been really really good and, and thanks for giving up so much of your time because i know you are on a time limit so thank you ever so much yeah no, no problem my, my, my pleasure if i if i may stress one last thing uh, Ellen, sure. because, um, um, I, very, I, I think that it's a, a missed opportunity that so many of us um travel to these countries to see natural history and so on. Um, but that if we would just go a little bit off the trodden path, there is a lot that we can discover. And, and it's actually citizen science is so important now inside Europe that if we can do something similar on our holidays, yeah. collect information, collect data, uh, take pictures of things and so on and publish these, uh, that would really help. That would yeah. really help draw attention to the enormous diversity and so um, I'd really would hope that, that for instance the, my, my bird watching friends um, will just try to do that extra step it's, 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 it's not so it's not so difficult yeah uh, as it may seem and uh, sometimes I get friends that say well I would like to publish something but I don't know how to go about it well actually it's not so difficult mm -hmm. <laughs> Just take that first step, take that first step and, and help the, develop the, uh, the information that we have on these in very important habitats. Yeah, so that's a good point that you make and, and, and I know you're rushing off, so we'll, we'll touch on this very, very briefly and then we'll talk about it again when we talk about Regua. Um, clearly, there has been a lot of birders that will have gone to um, Vietnam and some of them may watch this. And, you know, if, if you know, birders by their nature are interested in other wildlife as well and may have taken photographs. Would it be useful if anybody watching this that had taken a photograph actually emailed them to you so that you had records of them? <laughs> well, that's that's you risky. Thinking, Hang on, my because the interesting thing is I, I, I gave, I gave a, a talk um, uh, on Vietnam and the uh, Dragonfly Society, the Dutch Dragonfly Society, and I showed two pictures of common dragonflies and I said okay guys um, this is Brachythemis uh, contaminada the other one is Orthemis uh, discolor um, now never ever send me pictures of these species asking me what they are <laughs> because you have a few of these species that um, um, uh, either in, in, um, uh, in, in, in South America or in Southeast Asia, are uh, at every pond. Yeah. So I'm happy that if you take pictures of very common stuff. <laughs> but please, please. Yeah, so uh, if you find something interesting in the undergrowth somewhere deep in the forest, by all means send me the picture. But if it was at the pool of the hotel, don't bother. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Great note to end on. Yeah. Right. Tom, thank you ever so much. Thank and you. I will let you go and do your chore now. <laughs> and we will speak in maybe a few weeks' time, a couple of weeks' time about Regua. That'd be Take lovely. Thanks thank very you. much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.